so good evening ladies and gentlemen again uh, my name is justice i'm dean of business school um we started these engagements um a couple of months ago since the outbreak of covid and um, the essence of this has been to share knowledge uh, the essence of this has been to mm -hmm. ensure that we are able to create um, a platform that would stimulate thoughts that would ensure that we are able to influence what is being discussed in other words as a business school um, it is in our business to be able to shape the conversations that happen around and to ensure that these conversations happen the way we want them to be. And so we instituted the uh, Kobus business, um, we call it COVID Business and Society Seminar Series. Today we have two very, very important personalities uh, to present to us. The first person to present is the mayor of Accra, um, Honorable Mohamed Ajesua, who himself is an alumnus of this great institution. Um, he is a personal friend, so allow me to harass him as I just did. Uh, but um, he's a personal friend, so he wouldn't take this uh, uh, serious. Uh, but if he dares to make us a promise, we would take it and we would chase him and get it. Uh, uh, but if he doesn't, it's just our friendship, so don't get. Um, so he, as I said, he is um, a product of this university. He uh, has a master's degree from um, uh, Institute of Local Government Studies. Um, he's been doing some very, very wonderful work uh, around the place. Uh, Accra Metro is um, it's a very, very stubborn metro. And to lead it, uh, if you, especially if you know the history of people who have led it before, you know that uh, to have stayed in office for almost four years uh, means that he's been able to live up to the expectation of his uh, bosses, uh, the president. Um, so he will be speaking to us about COVID and the informal economy in Accra. Uh, the Greater Accra region has been doing a lot of work on um, resilience, informality, and all of that. So he'll be sharing with us some of the experiences of the Accra uh, Metropolitan Assembly. Um, when he is done, we would take Professor Frank Ohimi, who is also a personal friend. Um, uh, Frank Ohimin did something to me. I'm not happy, but I've forgiven him. He was supposed to join this department a couple of years ago. And even though he got appointed and everything was going, then he didn't come. So uh, I, I told him I won't forgive him. But uh, because he has agreed to speak to us on this occasion, uh, yeah, you, have, you have been pardoned. So I see no more. But he will be talking to us about bringing the state back uh, in bringing the state back in, um, and and it has to do with COVID and the administrative states. The those of us who are in mainstream public administration know the the all of the conversations about how we think the state uh, is is becoming irrelevant, and the fact that um, you know civil society space, uh, you know third sector must be the actors that lead the space, but. I haven't listened to his conversation, but I know that he's going to be making this very important um, argument about the role of the states in all of these. So we will take uh, Honorable um, Mayor first, uh, and then after that, we will take Mayor, you can speak up to 30 minutes. We will open up for Q&A, and our sessions have always been very, very, very active. So be minded that you will get a lot of questions at the end of the day. But otherwise, uh, you can project your slides and go ahead and give us uh, your presentation. Thank you very much. And let me welcome all of you, the participants here. Well, uh, uh, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, um, I'm quite excited to be invited to come and speak um, on your uh, COBU series uh, 2020. Um, I'm an um, active participant on a similar program in, in Harvard, um, and I'm happy to, to join um, a local series uh, at the University of Ghana Business School, where the focus has been building the capacity of uh, mayors around the world on how to, to 
um, fight COVID-19 and break through the, this uh, pandemic. Uh, and I'm happy to also share some lessons that I have learned from there as well. Um, thank you very much once again for this opportunity. Um, uh, I'll be speaking on COVID-19 and the informal economy in Accra. Um, uh, as you are aware, the informal economy is, is an area that I have uh, um, a special interest in it. So I'm um, very passionate about it. And uh, um, I find myself in the, in the city of Accra leading it where the informal sector is quite a dominant. Um, the, the structure of my presentation is basically going to look at the demographics of the city. Um, I also look at the role of the informal sector and why we should pay special attention to the informal sector. I will link into to COVID-19 and then enumerate some um, interventions um, that we have uh, done so far and uh, close my presentation uh, by letting you know some of the way forward uh, things that we are doing. If you look at Accra, Presently, and when I talk about Accra, I want to limit myself to this Accra Central um, that has a population now of about 1.6 million. However, there's a 2 million population that commutes into the city and goes out every day. So you have a resident population of 1.6 million in the evening and no, close to 4 million population, close to 4 million population during the day. Uh, the city has a growth rate of about 5.3%. And, and within the city space, despite the fact that you see a lot of people commuting by transport, in terms of um, modal split of commuting, people who walk by commuting at represent more than 50%. And therefore, um, pedestrian, um, safety is also very key in making sure that um, the city space is uh, more resilient. Uh, when you look at about economy and employment, the, the, it has a high um, literacy rate of about 89%, with about 70% of the population in the, in the economically active space. However, if you put all these together, you will realize that about 80% of the uh, of the labor force are in the private informal sector. Uh, and 82% of that is um, it's represented by females. So you could see that a lot of women are in the informal sector. But if you look at the national, national distribution of the uh, employment, you, you realize that um, a Greek um, um, takes quite a chunk of it. However, um, when it comes to the urban center where a Greek is largely non-existent, um, it's more of trading and 46% of the informal sector labor force are, are doing trading within the city space. Housing and sanitation, it's, it's part of the fabric of the city. And statistics shows that 58% of the people who live in the city live in the informal housing. So you can see that um, we are living in the city space where majority of the housing space is more informal and it's mixed together. And that's why you can find every plush community with an adjoining Zongo community or an informal settlement. In, unfortunately, um, um, we have about close to 50% of people who attend nature's calls using public place of convenience. And this is something that we also want to reverse in the sense that um, but as of 2015, 2014, when um, Accra was ranked as one of the most dirtiest cities in the World Bank um, indices, they looked at um, they looked at attending nature's call in your private home and attending nature's call in a public place of convenience, they, 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 are, they equate it to open defecation, and it does not augur well to us. And that's why we are doing one household, one, one toilet, and with a heavily subsidized rate in, 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 in Accra. And we've, we've done close to 27,000 um, household toilets um, since, 20, uh, since 2017, and the number keeps increasing. We are hoping to. Um, continue uh, with the World Bank uh, 
grant acts, uh, we, we move on. To look at the role of the and importance of the informal sector. One, it's about employment generation, which I've indicated that 80% um, of the labor force in Accra are in the, uh, in the informal sector. And then food security in Accra, um, a lot of the people to get access to food, whether cooked or uncooked food, is more coming from the informal sector. And, and people drive into the city space, either to Agboglushi, Mokola, and all these places to buy food stamps, and then also to get food also to eat. Transportation is also very key. And even um, quite apart from the normal trotters and the taxis that have come up, Uber has also come up. And then a new um, transportation, which is um, called Okada, that's the bicycle, tricycle, and then the motorbike, also that they use have also come up and all these are means of transportation which provides employment and opportunity for people to commute from one destination to the other the city gets its chunk of money also from um, from from the informal sector i.e the traders um, either the micro or small scale traders shop owners within the city space and the daily tools also that we also collect from them so we are very mindful of working closely with the uh, with the informal sector, and, and then waste, which is uh, one of the key areas of my administration that I have to deal with. You know, as indicated by His Excellency the President, um, waste generation in the informal sector represents you know about seventy percent of the amount of waste, and it comes from not only the low income communities. But from the major markets that includes Kaneshi, Kwasia Yasu, Agboglushi, these are the hotspots where you can get the high volume of waste which did. Accra, Greater Accra generates um, um, 7,500 tons of waste daily. But Accra alone generates close to 5,000 of the waste. So you can see that um, close to about 75% of the waste which is generated in the whole region it comes from Accra alone, and that's why we pay a lot of attention to waste. Um, COVID has come, which is very new, and we're looking at the informal sector and how COVID has impacted on the informal sector and what uh, interventions we are making to uh, bring it back to life. Um, Accra remains as the epicenter. All the analysis and the figure shows that um, uh, the community spread are more in the income, low income areas. And permit me to show you some figures. Yeah, these are uh, recent ones um, um, that we have in um, about a week ago. Um, Choco has about 68, which is a low income area. Um, ignore Kolibu, I'll explain what, why Kolibu is 293. But if you look at Banana Hill, which is a, a high end or a middle class area, you can see that it has just about the same as Kamara. But Bukum, 103, Old Fadaman, which is the, uh, where they call the Soro Mandura, 112, Abubloshi, 59, Koluoku. These are the low income areas, which largely informal. Kolibu has 293 because Kolibu now is a testing center. So people who come to Kolibu and test, and then the results shows positive, is captured as part of Kolibu. But it does not necessarily mean that they are coming from Accra. And so that is the distinction. However, because Kolibu is in Accra, we have not distributed it to the other areas, and we have taken it upon ourselves. So a summary of the COVID-19 cases in Accra shows that um, as at 25th July 2020, um, Accra, Accra Metro has recorded 1,011. And then the total recoveries, um, which is quite remarkable, 968. So we have active cases as at 25th July 2020, um, uh, uh, 43. Why should we pay attention to the informal sector? It is very critical, having given you the background why the informal sector is integral part of the fabric of the city. Uh, we need to know that um, uh, this pandemic, um, if we are not careful, 
will increase um, global uh, poverty, and that will largely impact on the informal sector. A lot of people are moving out from the formal sector because of loss of job, and people have to survive. So they are switching to the informal sector, and that's thereby the informal sector will be expanding. If you are working in a private place and it's locked down at the moment as a driver, you go for Uber or a taxi or uh, Okada and start. So the informal sector is likely to expand as a result of COVID-19. And thereby deepening also of inequality uh, because of livelihood issues, income issues, food matters. Uh, once the economy is shrinking, um, they don't have savings, they live by the day and it's very, and, and thereby for lack of income flows, they are most affected and these are the issues that concerns them as well. And we should pay attention to the informal sector so that um, the uh, poverty situation will not, will not get worse in Accra. And looking at the numbers that we have, if we are not careful, uh, we'll, have, we'll run into some difficulty. This COVID-19 has um, impacted on the economy of Accra and uh, the general losses of uh, jobs. Um, people are looking for jobs because they have lost their jobs. You know, people in, have also lost their incomes. And the city has also uh, lost significant revenue. Throughout the period of, of lockdown, we we're not collecting tools, we we're not collecting property, we we're not collecting anything. And that period, you are still have to pay your workers and service the city as well. So we've lost significant amount of revenue um, during that period, and we are still trying to recover at this moment. Um, you recall that um, as a result of the COVID-19 protocols, um, social distancing was supposed to be practiced in trotters and taxis. And at a point in time, they couldn't bear it any longer, leading to increase in transport fares. People were also advised to stay at home. But once they continue to stay at home, they, they eat a lot and they generate a lot of waste. So the waste generation ratio within the city center gradually tilted towards the residential waste generation. There's a lot more waste which is generated in the uh, in people's houses. But how did we deal with all these issues? Quickly, we were directed to form a public health emergency response committee. And this is chaired by chief executives of all assemblies. And the major and key um, departments um, within the city center had to fall, be part of these emergency response in, to deal with all aspects of COVID-19 on issues of health, on issues of em environment, disaster management, security, and all other issues as well. So it is not haphazard arrangement. However, um, we, we must admit that we, 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 we encountered some challenges, but we were able to bring all the major stakeholders involved to fight this COVID up to where we are now. Now, I'd like to give some key interventions um, uh, uh, when we started this COVID. Before the lockdown, the focus of the assembly was to make sure that businesses keep going and then maintain some um, reasonable high hygiene within the city space. So we started um, consulting and working with uh, our market leaders, identifiable groups, and also um, accelerate our community engagement by also educating them a lot. And you, you recall that this is, um, it's, it's, it's a new virus that its form and shape was not too known, and it kept changing us in terms of information. So we needed to make sure that um, information is given timely and uh, to change people's attitude, which was very key around that time. And, and we're, we were supplying those communities and then the markets, some Veronica markets, um, water storage facilities and uh, at the hospitals and many other places because we're told around that time that um, we need to make sure that we maintain high hygiene in, in our open and public spaces. Then we got another information that the virus is transmitted through 
droplets um, that uh, people uh, by people either sneezing, shouting, or so. so the face mask wearing became um, part of the protocol to prevent the spread of the virus. In that sense, AMA was the first to launch the wear your nose mask wear your nose mask campaign. And instantly on that day, we shared over 10,000 nose masks. We managed to convince the Regional Security Council to, to make it mandatory for anybody who's coming into the city space to wear your nose, uh, nose masks. Fortunately, His Excellency, the President um, took it up eventually and then has an executive instrument, um, uh, EI-64, to make it uh, mandatory and illegal for anybody who comes into the open space without wearing face masks. So we, we take pride in the, in, in the campaign and we're working with many other uh, uh, agents, non-state actors that are involved in the campaign of nose masks and the distribution of nose masks as well. During the lockdown phase, we quickly changed our focus then to looked at how to prevent the community spread and welfare support. Because now the COVID has come to our space. And as a city authority, what's, what, what, what's our goal in making sure that we contain the spread of the disease? So during that lockdown space too, in fact, it was the period that we saw a lot of um, um, vulnerable people in the, in, 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 on the streets of Accra. We were, we were sharing over 20,000 um, uh, cooked food every day um, through the through NADMO to individuals and households within the city, city center. As, as an assembly, we also uh, bought and, uh, raw food um, that is um, rice, oil, and some few items, and also distributed to over 5,000 uh, families uh, within the uh, communities. And then um, the government also came in once again at the tail end when they stopped the uh, cooked food and distributed also over 20,000 um, on cooked food to vulnerable households through NADMO once again, and then the churches as well. But in addition to all this, we also embarked on a disinfection exercise of markets, lorry parks, and all state buildings as well. In, in fact, all the ministries, buildings, including Foreign Affairs, Ministry of um, um, Interior, all the ministries uh, and agencies, um, as an assembly, we managed to, to, to disinfect their buildings, including markets and and at, at our own cost, and sometimes we also get support from um, um, other organizations that are willing to help out in it. And this is being done every month now, as I speak to you now. The disinfection exercise is being done every month now by the AMA. We also step up the public education campaign. We, um, uh, we, we had six uh, pickups with PA system that were deployed into the communities and the markets. Um, uh, embarked on an aggressive um, education on COVID-19 day and night at all these locations. You also recall that um, we took advantage of the lockdown period to embark on a major cleanup exercise with the army. We're very grateful to the army for the support that they gave to us on that day. And within that period, we also suspended the collection of our market tools and all the rates that we were doing. These are some few pictures which shows the work that we were doing during that period. And um, um, this table is just showing what the, the food items that we distributed, eggs, oil, tomato, and all kinds of things that we gave out. And we also used the NADMO as an institution also to give it out, just to depoliticize this whole um, distribution. Because in this country, almost everything, uh, we attempt to politicize it. And then some also um, items that we gave out to, we have a whole list of markets here, and some um, chief policies that we gave out some items to Veronica Buckets, Bucket Stand, washing, washing bowls, liquid soap, sanitizer, tissue paper, all kinds of things that we gave out during the COVID, the lockdown period, just to support people and make sure that uh, people live within the 
confines of the safety protocols. Post lockdown, of course, now we've come to know the virus and um, it has affected our economy so badly. And therefore, our focus then changed to economic recovery, but being also mindful of promoting the resilience of our health systems. So we continue to supply um, uh, PPEs and essential medical supplies to all the hospitals within our uh, within the AMA. And we do so sometimes we either buy it or we get it from companies that donate to us. We are also fortunate to also receive some items from our sister cities in Europe and in China, um, um, Freiburg and Guangzhou. They have all given us um, um, medical supplies and PPEs that we have given out to these uh, um, hospitals so that our frontline workers are, uh, are protected enough to fight this COVID. Um, the, the health campaign is also being done more aggressively now, and then we we'll continue with the disinfection exercise. But apart from some of these things, we also realize that the city is congested and there's a need for us to also open up and, and also to provide enough um, or reasonable um, health service um, through the support of GCB Bank, uh, managed to upgrade and expand the Osha Polyclinic. And the Osha Polyclinic serves Bukum, Jamestown, Old Fadama. These are all low income areas. And today, when you go to the Osha Polyclinic, it's, 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 it's so nice, you know, and people are happy to go there to, for their medical um, attention. Uh, and then we are also constructing a multi story isolation center at Kaneshi Polyclinic, which has also commenced. We continue to supply the PPEs and medical equipment as well. Mampobi Polyclinic is a beneficiary. Kaneshi Polyclinic is also a beneficiary. Princess Marie, which is the children's hospital, as well as the Osha Clinic, is also a beneficiary. So on the health side, these are some of the few interventions that I would like to share with you. Then on the economic side, because we're looking at the economic recovery and then them promoting the resilience of the city through the health health um, issues. Yes. Government announced through the NBSSI that they are giving out um, 600 million Ghana yeah. cities, micro and small scale enterprises. And the AMA office was used as a center for recruitment and registering of people from Mokola and all these areas. And as I speak to you, quite a significant number of them had received a minimum of 600 Ghana cities Thousand Ghana cities, two hundred uh, uh, twenty thousand, two thousand Ghana cities um, to to support their businesses. And uh, those who are asking for much bigger amount, they are still being processed. Yesterday, I had a meeting with the MBSSI National um, Executive Director, and she, they had promised that um, based on the request that they had, um, uh, they, they they are supposed to um, get additional funding to support the people. Um, the Coastal Development Authority also initiated the distribution of some money and they are giving out small grants and credit to, um, uh, to, to small and micro businesses within the coastal board. And when we talk about it, but we are not talking about those only along the beach, but uh, but Mokola and all this here, we are all close to the sea and we are also beneficiary of it. Um, and then the National Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program um, also initiated a small business incubator program targeting small and medium scale uh, enterprises. Um, they've had a series of training at my end, um, um, building the capacity of, um, of small and medium scale enterprises on entrepreneurship, and they are providing financial support to them. Most of their money are much uh, big, um, 20,000. Um, they are giving as much as 100,000 and 200,000 to uh, medium scale uh, businesses, all in our attempt to make sure that um, we, we support small and medium scale businesses. Um, in addition to all this, the Accra Metropolitan Assembly has also uh, uh, mindful of the fact that our market infrastructure is too weak and, and too small. So 
we quickly embarked on um, uh, market construction at Mokola, and we'll just finish with uh, phase one of uh, Mokola project that we are doing, which is um, um, taking over 180 stocks. And then the phase two has also commenced, is ongoing as I speak to you now. Um, we've just also started with the Tuesday market. All these are uh, attempt to uh, provide much bigger space in the market and for trading activities to be done in a more environmentally friendly manner with respect also to COVID-19 protocols. Having had these experiences and being mindful of all the issues that came up, um, we put in a crowd on the path to sustainable um, uh, recovery. And these are the key things that we have learned, which we are doing to make sure that um, our sustainable recovery path that we are on it should be able to, uh, to lead us to um, the desired end that we are looking at. We've established partners. And these partnerships that have been established, we, we, we've learned that they must be maintained. And we've also realized that the informal sector has got its own network of the way they do their things. And oftentimes, um, the assembly or government um, do not agree and disrupt it. But working with them and recognizing the kind of network that they have but forges a very close relationship with the informal setup, builds the kind of confidence and makes um, um, it easy for the assembly to work with the informal sector. And that's what we, we've learned and we are working with. Then again, we've also realized that, um, especially with the, with the middle class and, 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 and the high end people, that we tend to think that the informal sector is very disruptive. And this is one thing that we want to, we want to change. If you look at the informal sector, their kind of contribution to the city is so enormous, and therefore they must be recognized and be supported. An example is the it's, it's in waste management. You've given out contracts to big contractors to collect waste, and I can, I can assure you that without the active involvement of the informal sector collectors, those who use Aboboya, about 30% of the over 5,000 tons of waste which is generated in Accra Delhi will not be able to, to collect. And therefore, the recognition of the informal sector, informal sector must, be, must, be, must, be, must be encouraged so that we will not um, stay aloof and think that the informal sector is a bit destructive. And therefore, we need to increase the collaboration with them. Uh, and, and then again, um, in terms of decision making, um, we've, we've come to the realization, although it's been part of my work and in building the resilience of the city out of the five key areas, one of the key areas that it's, 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 it's very important is about, is about engagement and in decision making. Thereby, in decision making, um, the informal sector workers must be actively involved, and in which we do that all the time. Just yesterday, um, when we were looking at the Mokola um, phase three um, expansion that we want to do, we engage the, the leaders and we continue to engage them all the time. And then finally, we also want to change people's perception about the informal sector and recognize their contribution that as you pass around, when you use the Lagos Avenue, you see uh, people selling Ulman Bookman, that is um, uh, roasted plantain and then uh, and, and granite over there. These are people that are providing good service for all of us in the city space. And we need to recognize their contribution and work with them. All these efforts that national government is putting in to make sure that uh, we have the national health insurance, you have the Ghana card, you have the, uh, the Ghana post address system. They are all attempts to, to integrate or to mainstream the informal sector in the formal stream by recognizing them. And I think that that promotion should go on so that we'll be able to work in harmony with the informal sector. Their contribution is enormous and we recognize that 
within the city space. I'd like to thank you for, for, for your attention. And I'm quite open for suggestions and, and questions to, uh, to me. Thank you very much. Um, Honorable, we, we appreciate you. You, you, you. you exhibit the dexterity of a University of Ghana alumnus. Uh, thank you for the very wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm proud to be associated with you and your assembly. Um, so I am going to, there are already two questions for you. Maybe we we'll take those ones first before we, um, we go for the others. And the first question is coming from a very, very renowned person, somebody I respect so much, um, Dr. Koku Ofosudakwa. Uh, Adakwa was the, um, the chief director of Ministry of uh, uh, Communications uh, for a very long time. Um, and he, he is also an alumnus of my former university, University of Manchester. So we meet in other circles. And he has a question for you. He's, in, he's an IT person through and through. And uh, he says, Honorable Mayor, in recent times, new opportunities are created for technology usage to tackle urban challenges, and the COVID period is no exception. Please, what policy prescriptions will you propose to inform national policy drive towards smart city concepts? So as I said, Dr. Kweku Ofosu Adakwa, uh, that's the first question. The second question is coming from uh, Abdullahi Robert Aziz. He's a PhD student uh, here in the Department of Public Administration. Uh, he says, Honorable uh, questions for Honorable question one. In addition to Public Health Emergency Response Committee, what policy instrument is or was used by AMA when they noticed residential waste increase? Was the instrument effective and efficient? Then question two, what indicators is AMA using to measure the cleaner city of Accra? I wish that this question didn't come up, but it has come up. Um, so that's the second question. Two questions in one. Uh, what did you do when you realized that waste was increasing? Uh, was your strategy effective? Uh, question number two, what is your measure of cleanliness? What, how do you measure that? Question number three is from Harriet Nyama Ajiman. She says, how much did the intervention implemented during the lockdown cost AMA? And how did you raise funds? How much did you spend? Where did the money come from? Number two, it says, the multi-story building at Kaneshi Polyclinic has taken years to complete. How soon will it be completed and put to use? I'm not sure whether Kaneshi is part of your jurisdiction, but uh, this person, uh, Harriet, is a health professional, so you understand uh, the tilt of the question. So I have these three questions, or maybe five uh, in three for you. You can attempt a response to these ones whilst I take oral questions. So if participant, if you have any questions you want to answer, uh, you want to ask, sorry, uh, please show by hand on the, um, on the uh, discussion platform and then I would uh, authorize you to go ahead. So Mayor, please go ahead. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like to start from um, Harriet. Um, Kaneshi Polyclinic is part of AMA. That's why I indicated in my presentation how we supported it um, and we continue to support. Indeed, um, um, there was um, um, attempt some time back in like in 2014, or, I mean, years back. It's, it's more than 15 years ago to build this multi story structure. Um, but unfortunately, it, it was abandoned. And during the COVID time, we diverted um, resources to make sure we, we do it and com complete it so that we can have an isolation center. Um, so that's, that's, that's to Harriet. And then how much did, they, uh, did our intervention cost? Um, I 
I am not too sure I have the figures, so I will not um, hazard a guess. But uh, in terms of um, sources, one is that uh, we use our IGF um, to, to do a lot of things. In fact, including the Kaneshi uh, Isolation Center is our IGF that we are using to do and, and a lot of the things that we did. Then uh, the Ministry of Local Government also wrote to us to, um, to change the formula for the common fund that we also received and use part of it for COVID-19 activities. And, and then we also managed to raise funding and uh, mobilize um, logistics also from uh, non-state actors to, to do. So that is just by way of my response to Harrod. Um, uh, Abdullah, uh, in terms of residential waste um, increase and what did we do? Um, let me say that um, um, in, in Accra, every area has been assigned to a waste management contractor to collect domestic wastes. For instance, if you are living in the East Legon area, there's a company called Zoom Domestic. If you are living in um, Usu Enclave, there's a company called Jakura. If you are around, um, if you are around Dakuma area, Asadu waste, Dakuma would call Asadu waste, and then MWAS and Tropical waste, they are Liberty waste, they are all there. Um, however, as I indicated earlier, we were very mindful of the fact that these contractors that I came to, to meet do not have the capacity in terms of equipment holding even to service the, these um, domestic waste. And that is why in, we recognize and encourage the informal sector collectors. You recall that AMA and my good self won an award from Bloomberg by these um, uh, encouraging the informal sector collectors in, in waste management. One is that there are key things that we have done to make sure we have done it right. As they go around to collect, every abubo yard that you see, that's a tricycle that you see, you will see it embossed with an AMA, AMA logo and a certain number. They have all been registered. So in case anyone does something, we'll be able to track and tell you that this is the owner of that, of that Aboboya. That's number one. Number two, you have to travel from here to Po, which is about um, 72 kilometers or to Insumia in the west, in the eastern region, which is about 96 kilometers round trip to be able to go and down. These tricycles cannot go that far. So in Accra, for instance, to handle waste management issues, that's why in partnership with Zoom Lion, we have a risk waste recycling and compost plant along the Mochi Road, which is treating about 400 tons of waste daily. We also give them lunch that they have um, a waste transfer station at Achimota, which is receiving about 800 tons of waste daily. There's another one that I came to meet you know, at, um, at Newtown, but that is a very small size in terms of uh, transfer stations over there. So we, we, we have put in place certain measures to make sure that we handle waste management in Accra in a more efficient way. Because one of the biggest challenges that we had in Accra was lack of infrastructure and equipment. So all the talk about waste management, waste management, without that, we wouldn't be able to achieve where we are. And the clean city agenda, one of the key things that you have to do was to make sure that we provided infrastructure. Because waste management is not talk. Once the waste is somewhere, you'll be able to see it. I am aware well that the minister has spoken about about 85% um, complete that we have. This morning I was on a radio and I keep asking people, they should tell us where the waste, the heap of refuse is, and we'll be able to, to go and collect it. As I speak to you now, I came to meet over 40 heaps of mountains of refuse. One of it is even opposite at the Open Glow, opposite the uh, University of Ghana. Apparently, it's University of Ghana land. I wrote to them that they should collect. And we are going to collect the waste over there. And if they allow anybody to, to dump waste over there again, we are going to take over the land. Quickly, they have brought people who are now selling flowers there, and the place looks nice over there. So we have done 
our possible best when it comes to waste management in terms of making sure that you will not see heaps of refuse in town. Where we are getting a bit of challenge, which we are continuing to work on, is littering. People drink such a water and throw it onto the street. So when you come in the morning, you see the city very clean. By afternoon, you will see liters of waste around. But we we're working on some of these things. And we believe that um, um, even if, even if we, are, we are unable to achieve the dream, we may have made significant progress that we can be proud of. Today, as I speak to you now, we have not recorded cholera case in Accra. As of 2015, we recorded over 20,000 cholera cases and 200 people died. So there's, there's a public health dimension to waste and the economies of it is what I'm sharing with you. Mr. Dakwa on technology about smart city, this is a very big thing. In fact, when I came into office, I, I, I also love technology because relatively we are young. You could see that we have a website which is very active and want to use our website to do a lot of things you know, over there. Um, the smart city concept is very big and it, there are few things that we are looking at. But unfortunately, and suddenly he's coming from the Ministry of Communication, so he, should, he, will, he will know better. There are many players involved in making sure that the city um, uh, is managed in a harmonious way. For instance, you have Ministry of Roads that is handling traffic lights. So traffic signals is not directly under the assembly's mandate. So if a traffic light is broken down somewhere, I have to chase Ministry of uh, Roads and Highways for urban rules to come and deal with it. If they don't deal with it, I know that I get an insult, but it is their responsibility. We are working hard to make sure that all the other players that are, have something to do within the city space come together so that we'll be able to, uh, to, to get a comprehensive um, um, uh, policy. Other than that, I can tell you everything that, are, that can be done right, but if the rest are not ready to be on board, it will be very difficult for us to do. I have described our craft space since I assumed office that is like a pizza, and government agencies have their share. So everybody has got his share, and the assembly is at the center of it. You, get, you take the blame for everything, but probably you are not directly responsible for some other things. Uh, I, I, I do not want to give a definite answer but if, if, if you push me in, I will share with you some of the things that we think that's supposed to be done. But a key thing is just making sure that uh, um, technology is available and every assembly, every assembly, every public agency, and that's why I like the digitization agenda by His Excellency, uh, the Vice President, because that is the key. I, I am also a student of public admin, and I, thought that, I think that uh, the bureaucracy in the public sector will be uh, enhanced with, with technology. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable. Uh, I have two more questions here, and then I'll allow. Uh, let me allow uh, Belinda. Um, Belinda, are you there? Please unmute yourself and ask your question, and please be straight to the point so we can maximize time. OK. <clears throat> Fair. My name is Belinda. Um, I want to ask the mayor, um, I live in a densely populated area, Tishinungwa, and I'm a health worker. When I step out, I am seeing an increasing number of people who are not observing protocols, they are not wearing their masks, um, people are not hand washing, and when they even come to the hospital and you talk to them, they don't want to listen. And it is worrying because we are seeing increasing cases coming in daily. Um, I look at countries like Australia and Philippines going back, some parts going back into lockdown, and I think that um, it's a worrying trend. I want to ask you as a mayor, what are you doing to ensure that people stick to the protocols? It's as if COVID is, is almost gone and everybody's relaxed. Health workers are worried. Um, what are you doing to help the situation? Thank you. Thank you very much, Belinda. So the other questions in the chat forum says, um, so the next one is from Dr. James Mensah. He says, uh, as part of effort by government to support the informal sector, uh, the coronavirus alleviation program has been put in place and implemented through NBSSI. Um, 
However, the requirements include business registration certificate and tax identification number. It is clear that about 80% of informal sector players do not have these requirements. What would you propose to ensure that the informal sector in Accra benefits from the uh, COVID-19 alleviation program to help them to recover? And then from Teresa Barnes, um, my focus is the health sector PPE supply and how um, do we ensure these supplies get to the district and sub-district because we still lack PPEs and the health workforce is at risk. How do we ensure effective and efficient distribution of PPEs because these facilities require constant supply? So um, may all be informed that we currently are running a clinical leadership and management program that has uh, almost 150 health workers uh, in your department, public administration and health services management. And many of them are the ones uh, jabbing you with the health related questions. So you have nurses, doctors, pharmacists, and what have you. And they are concerned because your presentation is also about COVID and how the assembly is helping to manage this. The last one before you take off uh, to answer is, I stand to be corrected, but I didn't hear the contribution of the private hospitals in fitting uh, COVID. Uh, the mayor's plans to support them in the fight. In other words, how are the private hospitals and pri private, um, yeah, in fighting COVID? How, how is the private health sector, if you like, the private hospitals supporting this fight? And do they benefit from the kind of things that you are giving to public hospitals? So you can go for these ones. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, once again, let me pick from the last one. Um, admittedly, our attention, it's not on the private hospitals. Um, it's been on almost on the public um, health facilities. So I may not be able to speak a lot about the private uh, hospitals, apart from few like the, the SNIT hospital, because um, it's a place that I also go and, and they also do disinfection and all that. But our effort okay. and our support yeah. has not been to, to, towards the private hospitals. PPE supplies to health workers. I, I wish to get um, the specific locations because this is also an, a platform for me to also follow up uh, as a public servant on areas where they are short, they are short of some of these things, and I bring it to the attention of the of the health ministry because, uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, they have now fashioned out a more efficient way of distributing these PPEs. But we know that uh, these are disposables, so we keep um, supplying them with some of these things. But if I am able to be given specific locations, either in Accra or any part of the country where there's a shortage of some of these things, I'll bring it to the attention of the ministry so that they can do it. Because be mindful of the fact that as an assembly, we are only supporting and we are not the ones that is providing the health workers with the PPEs. Um, James um, asked to talk about uh, business registration certificates um, and TIN numbers as a requirement for the MBSSI cash. I, I am not I am not, I'm not, I'm not aware that uh, uh, the business registration certificate is part of the MBSSI cash, although it is part of the, uh, of the NEIP cash, that's the National Entrepreneurship and um, Innovation Program. That is one, but that, because that is a much bigger money, but the MBSSI, I am not too sure, but I know the team is part of it. And, James, if you look at the number of people that applied with the team, that single project alone has been able to enroll a lot of informal sector actors into the former sector by getting a team number. So they can do businesses now. Because as you're getting the team number, it's an easy, easy, it doesn't cost you money to get the team number. So uh, as much as um, it's something new, but it's an opportunity. In fact, during the registration time, you know how big my compound is. We have to provide lots of chairs to people so that they can come in and come and register and go away. And all of them have the team numbers. Indeed, 
the GRA also assigned officers to some of the areas also that were um, registering the applicants and giving them team numbers on the spot so that they can use their team numbers for to apply for the cash. So I, I think that is a good thing and um, we'll use it um, as a tool to be able to, to get a lot of people into the former stream. Uh, Belinda's concern about um, uh, people not observing the safety protocols. Uh, let me share this. The position of the Ghana Health Service today, especially in Accra, is that if we are able to enforce the wearing of the nose mask for the next four weeks, we will cut the transmission of the virus to zero. That is the position. And they are, they are saying that wherever two or three people are met, the virus is potentially present. So I share your position. And this is why, if you observe, every morning if you come to my office, you will see five military pickups, 30, 30 about, um, no, about 40 military personnel with three men, three officers who are the leaders. And then we have um, a police, and then we have... Um, our tax force, and then we have the environmental health officers who are also in our pickups. They are deployed in town every day for the past four weeks, and we are going to do that for the next uh, six months. To go into town and do two things, they are response. The assignment, one is to enforce sanitation bylaws, and two, to enforce the wearing of the nose masks. Um, I'm getting, I've tried to get Tashinungwa is outside my jurisdiction, but I'm getting all of them to also have, um, to form a local tax force so that we can get the military to go and support them and the police as well. But it's important we do some of these things as well. Tashi, for instance, is in the news as I yesterday. Just this morning, I, I, I had a WhatsApp video for my own people. I originally come from Tashi because my father comes from Tashi. That they have been asked by the people not to go on a street procession as part of our moral festival. The police were there the whole of three days ago in the night. When they left around 4 a.m., then the people came out and they went on the street procession. The police came back and stopped them and it turned into another whole political thing and they were on the street. And if I share the video with you, it would be so embarrassing. As I speak to you now, 10 people have been arrested, they've gone to court um, and uh, they have been fined 14,000 Ghana cities each or go to five years uh, five years in jail, in jail. So I'm just trying to let you know some of the efforts that we are doing. And I think that we need to step up the education because the rate of recoveries seem to give us a certain confidence and solace that, oh, all is well, but all is not well. And as for me, I'm quite fighting this head on because Accra still remains as the epicenter. And I, I want to take this up to other areas as well so that we can step up our effort. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, there's one more question, but unfortunately, because of our time, um, Selassie, um, let's hold on and listen to the professor. And if time permits, we would give Mayor the opportunity to answer his question towards the end of the presentation. It's past seven o'clock, and we want to be able to close before eight o'clock so we don't keep people too long. So, um, Honorable, we appreciate your um, time with us and, and talking to us um, this evening. Uh, now we would take you to uh, Canada. Professor Frank Ohimi is reaching us from Canada. Uh, Professor Ohimi is um, an associate professor in um, in the University of Concordia. Yes, yes, in Concordia University, he's an associate professor. His area is in public management, public sector management. He's he's done a lot of work. If you dot com him, the way Professor Seki says it, if you dot com him, he know he's a professor of good repute and good standing. He is a member of very many, many, many international professional uh, societies. Um, often when we, we go elsewhere, we meet him. Everywhere you pass, you meet him. 
and the, he's able to terrorize the, the whites with his deep knowledge in the areas of public administration. This evening, he's talking to us about bringing the state back in, COVID and the administrative states. Um, Professor, we are here to listen to you. Uh, if you have slides and you want to project them, you can do so now. And you can talk to up to 30 minutes and then we can have a conversation. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dean uh, Baule. And pardon me, I know uh, the fight between the two of us. Um, I'm not sure if the mayor will be able to settle it, but I know that you've already won. So please, uh, my apologies. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> exactly. Uh, we, we keep fighting and we keep going. So uh, that's what we do. And thank you very much for the invitation. Um, as you can see, I'm trying to share my slide. Um, I'm not a PowerPoint person, from as you know me. So I don't have fancy slides like uh, the mayor to um, display. So I hope that you can see uh, my slide and then um, we'll be talk able to talk after that. Mm -hmm. um, I thank the mayor very much uh, for what he's discussed, but that is very important, the things that he discussed because it ties into exactly some of the things that I want us to talk about. What I want us to talk about is the importance of the state. And that is what the mayor was highlighting. A lot of the things that AMA, um, and all those uh, uh, state institutions have done. But it comes back to the question that, could they have done better? And the, to me, the answer is yes. And I'll explain why I'm saying that they could have done better than what maybe the mayor has explained. And it comes back to understanding what we call the role of the state in society. So let's go to um, what I'll call um, then my next slide, What uh, I'm talking about when I mentioned the, the state. My presentation is not about the politics. Um, the mayor made an interesting point that in Ghana, everything is politicized. Um, my discussion is more into general uh, discussion about what is the role of the state. And it doesn't necessarily focus on Ghana. We'll come to Ghana a little bit. But why do we need the state? As I've already explained, the mayor has highlighted the importance of, for example, the assembly. Now, the assembly can be considered as a state or what I would describe as the administrative state. So when I talk about the state per se from the, my slide, you can see that I am not referring to, again, the politics, but I'm referring to the bureaucracy that works for the political executive. The mayor knows that in his uh, assembly, he also has what we call the public bureaucracy headed by, I think, coordinating director, for example, who helps the mayor in terms of deciding or making policies as to what can be done best. And it comes back to the point that, uh, what I'm going to talk about as the importance of the state in the sense that if you have a strong bureaucracy or an efficient bureaucracy, for example, then some of the policies that the mayor mentioned could have been done even earlier before going on to have uh, what you call crisis management approach to crisis. And that seems to be the problem. Now let's look at the world and in relation to COVID, now that we've explained what I mean by that. Before I go, let's look at the world. You will see that majority of the states, especially those in Europe, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, South Korea, Japan, who have done quite extremely well in terms of containing COVID has a very powerful or important administrative state by important bureaucracy that is efficient, that is hardworking, and that is able to come out with policies that helps the political authorities. You can also see that in most interventions that are done in these countries are led by these bureaucracies. Most often you hear the Canadian prime minister probably just talking, because he has been fair to give just a little bit of political statement. The rest is then left to uh, the director of health services, for example, for Canada. When you go down to the uh, provincial level in Canada, for example, it's a federal state. So we have the federal government, we have the provincial government. Uh, we, we have the same kind of approach where the um, 
the provincial uh, uh, premier will make a statement, but everything then is left to the bureaucracy to let it fashion out. Then when you come to the local level, vis-a-vis -vis where the, uh, the mayor is sitting, for example, is the same approach. The uh, mayor of my city, Ottawa, will make just a little bit statement, but everything comes from that bureaucracy. Uh, for example, he talked about uh, marks. The mayor uh, in my city never announced that. It is the chief uh, medical director, for example, who worked these things out and issues uh, those directives for us to work. So when you compare most of these states, Europe and uh, New Zealand, South Korea, and those that I've talked about, these are countries with what we call an effective administrative state that have been able to uh, do things to what we call flatten the curve when it comes to uh, COVID-19. Now let's compare that to the United States. Um, I'm not going here to bash the United States, just a, a kind of comparison. The university, uh, sorry, the United States has an important bureaucracy, I mean, effective bureaucracy, but weak in the sense that the bureaucracy work is normally overshadowed by the politics. Therefore, we see uh, what is happening. Only yesterday, there were 1,500, I think uh, the figure talks about the highest death of 1,500 people die in the United States. Who mandates, uh, for example, Marx? The bureaucracy can't talk. We know how they've stifled, for example, the CDC. That's supposed to even understand diseases and everything and highlight that to work in WHO, or a World Health Organization, so that some of these things will be addressed. But why are we in this state? Why are some states probably performing better than others? Now, let's go back to why I, I'm getting, again, my topics to bring in back the administrative states. I'm happy that the mayor uh, is a public administration person, so he might have known a little bit, and most of our audience are all public administration. So I'm not going to talk so much about certain things. But we can go back to a little bit of history. From 19, uh, late 1979, when Margaret Thatcher assumed power in UK and Reagan came to power in 1980 in the US, we now had something called uh, uh, the Reagan Thatcher Revolution. And what was the revolution about? The revolution was an assault or a condemnation of the administrative state. In fact, they highlight the point that the problems that the society was facing, irrespective of which country they are, is because of the administrative state. In the sense that they talked about the fact that bureaucrats are lazy, bureaucrats don't want to work, bureaucrats waste money. And so, so to them, the best way to ginger or to enable economy to grow in every state is to go to the private sector. And you can only go to the private se sector by reducing or thinning or hollowing out or in some cases, as some scholars will say, banishing the administrative state or the same. In other words, let's get rid of, for example, the civil service. Let's get rid of the public service. All that we need in state is the military and the police who can make sure that rogues in the society, um, I think you mentioned, uh, the mayor mentioned Tishi, for example, those kind of rogues, you send the police there and then you, you, you crash whatever revolt they're going and allow the private sector to go on. Now, this idea, what we have called in the academic what we have, what we call the administrative state, for example, or the assault, came in the form of structural adjustments in developing countries. Now, the, the, the important thing is that we have to understand that at the time that structural adjustment was introduced in many places, including Ghana, the administrative state was itself in some problematic shape not because of what the civil service or the public services couldn't do, but mostly what I call the political authorities have failed to do. Because you see, when you talk about the civil service or public service vis-a-vis -vis in relation to the political authorities, it is like master-servant relationship. Now, if I have a servant at home, for example, and I don't tell the servant, this is the food I'm going to eat today. Or the, the, uh, the, my servant makes, uh, Theosophy for me today. The next morning, I don't tell him or her what you have to cook for me. He or she may assume that I enjoy the Theosophy so much that the next day I would like to eat Theosophy. That is why I didn't tell him or her. 
Meanwhile, the next day, maybe I want to eat a mutuo. But remember that I have refused to tell that servant. And therefore, the servant goes to prepare Tiozafi. Now, do I blame the servant for not making me Omutuo and Tiozafi? No. So we see that part of the problem that the public bureaucracy or the administrative state faces was not necessarily because civil servants were lazy or don't want to do anything, but because the direction that is being given, or if in cases, are not even being given any direction at all. Therefore, they take their initiative to do things, and when there is a problem, then we tend to blame them. That's to these ideas that it is important that we get rid of the civil service or we limit the civil service so that the political authorities make decisions, and that affected the administrative state so much. There are a lot of statistics in Ghana. As I said, I don't want to get so much into Ghana uh, because of uh, my own uh, certain issues, and I can take those questions, for example, um, during the question period. Now, therefore, what has that had an impact on the society? And as I've already explained, COVID has had a very uh, health consequences. Uh, there's no doubt about that. I think the mayor mentioned a lot of some of these, uh, I mean, his own statistics. So there's no need for me to repeat that. But uh, daily news, you will see that. Um, I believe uh, Professor Bawili had uh, 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 the president of American Pol uh, Public Administration Society on this forum a couple of weeks ago, and he showed an important uh, uh, graph about what the effect when it comes to health issues. Um, Professor Nkrumah was here also, uh, Abakan Nkrumah was here a couple of weeks ago. They talked about all these things. But we can see the health consequences that has affected people. Uh, I'm happy that the mayor mentioned about, I think, is that 11,000 uh, cases or 1,100 cases? And that nine has recovered or something like that. But we see uh, the effect in the sense that if you listen to the experts, in fact, you may recover, uh, and I'm not sure how the mayor, for example, have seen this. You may have the 968 recovery, but there's now an issue that there is what we call a residual effect of COVID, for example, in which people are developing certain diseases, even though they have recovered from COVID. And so the effect of that is becoming significant. And I'm not sure, for example, in Ghana, whether we have the capacity, for example, to look into these ideas. That takes me back to, again, what I was talking about earlier, that when they hallow the state, it means that the capacity of the administrative state to work effectively to address some of these dire consequences of societal issues, what uh, Professor Baule would call the wicked problems of society, for example, it's difficult for them to do what they are expected to do. And remember that with COVID, we don't see the private sector anywhere. So the idea is that why have COVID had so much significant impact? And the consequence or the answer to that question is the fact that through this thinning and hollowing out, we hollowed out the capacity of the administrative state to do what exactly the administrative state is expected to do. We talked about economics. I mean, again, look at the stock market, for example. Um, the mayor mentioned about the informal sector. I'm happy that he talked about it in the sense that the assembly itself has even lost revenue. So you see, the, to be able to build the capacity of the assembly, the needed revenue that they need is now in short form. They need to collect the garbage. Where are they going to find the money to collect the garbage? In most cases, they will end up probably in the World Bank and borrowing. And we know, um, again, I don't want to go there, the kind of borrowing that has gone to Ghana right now. And we don't know how our grandchildren are going to be able to pay for such a borrowing. borrowing. So the mayor talked about it. Then another important consequence that we are facing is poverty, which I'm happy that the mayor also highlighted. It is not only in Ghana, but everywhere. In most societies, in US, for example, right now, there's a fight, for example, what? What can government give to its citizens in terms of uh, what they call uh, um, uh, COVID, uh, COVID uh, um, adjustment policy where some money is given to you? And they have not been able to figure it out. Now, when you go to states where this bureaucracy is strong, in Canada, in uh, Europe, these countries were able to set up their own policy rights in the sense that they've addressed significantly this poverty issue in which people are receiving money so much so that it cushioned them significantly. Now, when the, uh, in Canada, for example, when this was started, a lot of people were getting the money. So people were worried that some people who are not even qualified to get the money are getting it. 
how is the government going to address with that? The government just came out and said, don't worry, because the Canada Revenue Agency, which is equivalent to Ghana Revenue Agency, has the capacity to notice after three months those who were not supposed to receive it and have received it. Therefore, what the government did was that to warn them that if you do not qualify and you've received it, be prepared to pay back. And I can bet you that they will be able to collect every dime that those who are not qualified have gotten. But what is happening is that because of the ability of the administrative state that they have in place, they have been able to reduce or cushion the, po uh, the poverty level in which people have gone through if the administrative state had not worked effectively to establish some form of policy ground for the government to work on. We have the same thing in Ghana. I, sometimes I have my doubts because the, Canada, uh, the, sorry, the Ghana Revenue Agency itself is weak in terms of capacity. Um, I was in Ghana in 2008, uh, 18, and I was collecting data on uh, something the mayor didn't talk about, which is uh, property tax, for example. And I had um, Mr. Safu Mafo saying that uh, the Ghana Revenue Authority should be able to collect pr uh, property tax. I laughed and I said that this man is not serious because he doesn't seem to know what he's talking about. But again, the point is that, and I will come to Ghana, is the fact that in most institutions of the state, the capacity is very low. And therefore, things that they are supposed to do, they can't even do it. Seriously, if the mayor mentioned the point of even bringing the police and the military in, under normal circumstances, if the assembly, for example, has that capacity, the assembly should be able to do these things without necessarily the military. Because what then you, have, you are doing is that you are militarizing the society in a democratic society, which is not what should happen unless you are in an authoritarian regime. And so you see, again, the capacity problem of the assembly is that they don't even have the men to be able to do some of the things that they are supposed to do. I can excuse the mayor when he said Teshin is not in his jurisdiction, so that um, the mayor there cannot respond to some of these things. But it boils down to the fact that we, in most cases, when we do not have the capacity, the state capacity is weak, then this kind of problems that the mayor talks about uh, comes into play. Now, let me highlight some, why is it that uh, we, the COVID has exposed what we call the neoliberal approach in which the state was supposed to be weak. You will see that in COVID, we will see that a lot of these political institutions are now very, very weak. Cap uh, capitalism or corporate capitalism, that was supposed to replace that administrative state. The private sector that is supposed to help the administrative state function, um, the NGO sector or the non-governmental society sector, civil society, that was supposed to help the administrative state. And have all, most of them, if we have to say it, have recorded into their shell because they are not necessarily set up in terms to deal with this kind of wicked problem. The only institution that can address such wicked problem is the state. However, if you keep reducing the capacity of the administrative state, then my brothers and sisters, you're going to have a lot of problems. And that is why now we, most scholars are now calling back, we need to bring back the state in and we need to bring, to build the capacity of the state. As I said, one of the wicked uh, problems that we face so far is the fact of the weak, uh, weak administrative capacity as a result of the Hollywood out. As a result then, what state do we need? Market forces have not helped us. The private sector has not helped us. In fact, um, I think one of, responding to one of the questions, the mayor talked about the fact that they have not even looked at the private sector hospitals because they may not even have the capacity, for example, to take over some of the things that the state will do. Hence, it is very important for every one of us, whether we are researchers or whether we are interested, to revisit how then do we build the state? How do we build the administrative state so that when we are faced with such wicked problems, for example, we are, not, we are able to address that? And that brings us to the question of, uh, for example, developing countries. Because when Margaret Thatcher and the Reagan Revolution highlighted, and as I've already talked about, the structural adjustment programs and what the administrative scholars will call the new public management, the governance, all focus on the fact that the state needs to retreat and bring in this private sector. But we have come to realize that it is not always the same. You cannot have a good private sector. You cannot have a good informal sector, for example, when your administrative capacity is ex extremely weak. In fact, uh, the mayor mentioned the fact that the, uh, the, the 
the municipality, the AMA will have to even understand the kind of relationship or the kind of network that these uh, 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 informal sectors have in order to complement, for example, even tax collection or tool co collection, for example. But that is not the duty of that, uh, 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 of that association or that network. And even if that is their duty, you still need the state, the administrative state, in this case, the AMA to have that strong ability to discuss, for example, to liaise with these people so that the right revenue, for example, is collected. But we know that that is not has happened. Now, let's go back to why the Europeans have done well. I hope my time is up. Why the Europeans have, have, uh, have done well compared to other countries and why we need to learn from what the Europeans have done. Uh, in 2011, uh, the late Professor uh, uh, Pollitt and his colleague wrote something called, what he called, the Neo-Barbarian State. In other words, if we want to build the state that is capable of doing what the state is expected to do, then we need to go back to what the state itself is. And they came up with that idea of that we need a new form of barbarian idea, not necessarily a new form where the state is weakened through what we call neoliberal idea that the state is not important and that the market or the private sector is more important. I'm not going to highlight that this is a theory, but something that I just wanted to do that. In Ghana, for example, because we know that administrative capacity is weak, the question that we need to do is that, how can we build a new barbarian state, for example, in Ghana, in order to ensure that when we face wicked problems, such as COVID, for example, some of the issues that the mayor talked about are well addressed. They, even the mayor highlighted uh, issues like uh, garbage collection and those things for, for example, even because, before COVID. And that is why everybody was laughing when the, mayor, uh, the minister said that Accra is 85% clean and something like that. I read that and we were all kind of laughing that how do you achieve that and how do you measure those things. Part of the problem in developing countries and in Ghana especially, and here I want to focus a little bit on Ghana, is that over the years, through the structural adjustment program, our bureaucracy has been wicked. And it is not only the structural adjustment program. If you want to go back to when Ghana gained independence, by the time the British left, for example, they have created an institution for a, based on what we call the merit system or bureaucra a bureaucracy in such a way that that was supposed to fashion the way like the bureaucracy in the UK fashioned before the Thatcher Revolution. What we failed to do as a country is that we failed to do what you call enough bureaucratization. In other words, the state that was supposed to bureaucrat bureaucratize in other, and when I talk about bureaucracy here, bureaucratization, I'm not talking about red tape. Please, let's get, not get me wrong. I'm not talking about red tape, but we are talking about a, an institution, administrative institution, where, for example, the merit system is very strong. Unfortunately, since the period of Nkrumah, up to today that I'm talking about, Ghana's administrative state has been highly politicized, so much so that the merit system and the merit principle normally does not or do not apply, sometimes in most cases, in terms of who gets a job at the civil service or most public service institutions. So what have we been doing? Just sometimes even to privatize because we don't, we don't have the capacity even to manage state institutions. A good example is the privatization of the airport, for example. If we have a strong uh, administrative institution, we don't have to necessarily maybe privatize. And I'll come to that. Privatization is just a, sh a shock therapy. It doesn't cure. It's like when you have a malaria, and you uh, malaria, you go to the hospital, and the doctor immediately injects you so that your temperature comes down. That is all that is, it does. But if we have a strong administrative state, then some of these things can be addressed. So the first point that we need to do is to depoliticize the bureaucracy to depoliticize the administrative state and go on focusing on the merit system in which people who are well qualified get a job. Second, we need to develop a professional public service and that comes with to the merit system. When you have a well developed uh, public service, you develop a, a, a cadre of professionals who knows that we are working towards the effectiveness of the state. Unfortunately in Ghana, and based on my own research and conversation with a lot of public servants, what is happening is that we don't have a lot of professionals there, simply because, for example, and again, please uh, pardon me because I'm not being political, but for example, you have what you call uh, uh, um, special assistants who are not 
professional bureaucrats, but who have become gatekeepers. So much so that they serve as, before you can go and see a minister, you have to pass through them. And what is happening is that it's demoralizing the professional core bureaucrats, for example, in order to do this. And I'm not the one saying it because the union uh, in 2018 highlighted this issue of, uh, um, uh, of uh, uh, these gatekeepers that are preventing qualified bureaucrats, qualified professionals to do their job. And so we need to understand again the point, the politics of why we need to depoliticize the bureaucracy. Because when you do that, they are able to formulate effective policies that will address some of these things rather than mostly what we do ad hoc or crisis management, which seems to be the problem Ghana is doing when it comes to COVID. Because, the, for example, the mayor mentioned uh, the uh, certain intervention. I think the, the government has to ask for what public health emergency response committee. When you have a good administrative capacity, this committee should have already should be in place rather than responding because of crisis. But we don't have that. And it is important for us to highlight that point. Now, when you go to the bureaucracy, the most another important thing that we need to do is what we call responsible management, led by responsible leadership. And responsible management and responsible leadership talks about leaders who are honest, leaders who focus on ethics, Leaders who knows that I am in the public service because I want to serve the country. I'm not there because I want to make money. And therefore, I'm not going to sell PPE. As we know, for example, that some of the things that the mayor mentioned, I mean, read in the news where somebody at, uh, I think, a NAS video, where somebody at uh, the Rich Hospital, for example, selling PPE. When you have responsible leadership, they are able to address some of these. They are able to engage the cadres of the people and understand to and help them to understand why they are in the public service, that they are not in the public service to enrich themselves. Then the most important, how then do we build the capacity? Because the mayor highlights so much. I'm not going to talk about it because this is not a lecture. But one important that way that most uh, these European countries who have done very well, using, uh, who have built their capacity based on this new barbarian approach is what we call co-design. In co-design, what we have is that instead of the political authorities, say mayor, for example, that I want to reform the bureaucracy in my assembly, is that the mayor will give it to the uh, coordinating director and say, look, talk to your people, come out with an effective way that we think we can build a capacity and bring it to us and let's see how it can be funded. In most cases in Ghana, bureaucratic capacity has been top down. And mostly people say that, well, go to this training. Whether the training will benefit that person or not, nobody cares about that. Perhaps because somebody may be getting some money or some consultant may be getting some money. So you will see that a number of these capacity initiatives do not necessarily benefit the public servant who is supposed to build his or her capacity so that he or she can address some of the concerns that the mayor, for example, has reduced. Therefore, what do we need? How do we go about bringing the capacity? Uh, designing capacity initiatives. It is important that we recognize the importance of the public servants, sit with them and design capacities based on where they feel that there is a need to build that capacity. We need to stop that top-down approach. And we need to stop what we call the diffusion of policies in which people from, for example, somebody in the US or somebody from Canada comes to Ghana and said, well, we are doing this in Canada, so this is good for Ghana. It is a fundamental problem in which the bureaucracy is facing in Ghana, whether it's at assembly level or whether it is at the, at the national level. Hence, it is important that we can learn from others. Let's put it this way. We can learn from others. But what is essential in the learning process is what we call policy adaptation. We need to adapt these kind of capacity initiatives or what we are learning to, to our environment, especially when you have an environment in which uh, 85 or 80% 80 of the people are in, in the informal economy. How do you do that? You cannot take what is being done in Canada, what is being done in the United States, or what is being done in the UK, and say that that will fit in Ghana. Because in that particular country, the informal sector is very, very small. Hence, everything is developed based on the formal sector approach. That is extremely important that we co-design with those uh, people for example, I think the mayor, the mayor mentioned, you go to the, uh, how do you collect garbage in the market, for example? 
you go to uh, the assembly people, uh, not the assembly, the market people, and find a way, sit down with them, and design a capacity issue that will fit in terms of how you collect the garbage. Until we are able to do that, and until we are able to build the capacity, we will always be doing what we call crisis management. And anytime a crisis hits, then we'll be rushing. And we will do that, we will do, we make policies that then people, as the mayor said, being politicized. For example, the way the food was distributed was, did not, not move, for example, has a capacity. For example, we saw a lot of NGOs. There was no even a lot of areas, no coordination. What is going on? Which is a vital problem in Ghana. So therefore, it is important for we in Ghana, for example, to rethink how can we build a strong administrative state so that we are able to address some of the wicked problems that we are expected to have. Thank you very much. And I would like to take your questions. Thank you very much, Professor Himin. Um, I, I know how passionate uh, you are about these things and, uh, and, and especially your passion for, for Ghana. Uh, every good public administration scholar like yourself uh, is, is almost passionate about getting uh, not only the theory works, but the, the practice of public administration to work. And like you said, there are extremely important linkages between all of the very important points that you have raised. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have about 20 minutes or so to have a conversation. And I'm going to, uh, there are questions that have been asked here already that I will ask them. Otherwise, uh, if you have to ask a question, we would crave your indulgence to make it snappy and one question so that we can have a few people to ask their question. Um, the, the first question is coming from uh, Infernis Hot 6. It says, how uh, primary healthcare workers have neglected their, their, um, their basic responsibility of providing care for patients or people who report for care due to fear of such persons having COVID-19. Some deaths are suspected to have been recorded due to this. How do we psych such health workers to ensure proper care uh, for all? Or what punishment? I will leave out the punishment part of the question. Um, the other question talks about the, uh, so that's Harriet, apparently, if a follow-up comment to it. So let me jump you, Harriet. Uh, but the, Teresa says, thank you for your presentation. We need to depoliticize the public health care system. Oh, wow. Uh, and ensure responsible leadership. Individuals with the requisite qualification and experience need to occupy leadership position and must be accountable. The poor performance in the public health sector is a result of poor leadership and governance. How do we write? Uh, how do we make things right? Where do we start from as a nation? A very huge conundrum, very, very complex issue. The chicken and egg issue probably. Uh, as he says, what is the role of trust in building the administrative states? And I guess that's a very important question. Uh, what is your view on the minds? Uh, what is your view on the minds of Ghanaians that the best administrative state is to have statement bureaucrats? Hmm. Okay. Right. So let me leave you, Professor, to ask this. And I have uh, Dr. Musa Isaja uh, who is joining us from Germany. Uh, you would ask a question. So, but I will get uh, Prof to answer these two first, and then I'll come to Surubu Justice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean, and thank you for, I think, I, I think uh, Teresa's question is mine. Uh, I, um, I, think, I don't think Harriet was questionless about what I said. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So you can leave that up, yeah. I'll look at uh, Teresa. I mean, Teresa made an interesting question where he's talking about um, the poor performance of public health sector, if I can read it right, is a poor leadership and governance. The question is that why do we have poor leadership in the first place? Why well, you guys are going now? Okay. So, why do we have the poor leadership in the first place? L let me give you a good scenario. Let's go back to uh, a little bit of history. At the time Ghana had independence in 1957, Ghana was way ahead of South Korea in terms of development, human resource rights. Ghana has better human resource than South Korea, than Malaysia, than Singapore. But today, why is South Korea? South Korea is even better than uh, in terms of US and other places in terms of development. When you go to the OECD website and look at the statistics, 
How did they arrive at that? They arrived at building an effective, uh, what you call administrative state. In South Korea, that was built through what you call the developmental state. How did they build that developmental state? You can only have a de developmental state if you have a good bureaucracy, if you have a good and effective administrative state. So what did the South Koreans do? For example, economics. They will go to the Ministry of Finance and within the Ministry of Finance, and the Japanese also did the same thing. They will go to the universities, take the best and the brightest through the hiring process, effective merit system, merit approach, and then take the most core people. So maybe you go to the economics, you take the first class students, you find out who can do very well. And they station them within this uh, oh, yeah. For example, the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of, uh, I think, Trade, for example. And this became what we called think tanks within ministries. And every policy that the government was going to implement, whether trade policy, whether microeconomic policies, was developed by this core group of brilliant students. And they helped them to develop these kind of leadership skills. So the first thing we need to do, as I said, is that we need to put in place what I call enough bureaucratization. That is, we need to go back to the verbose idea and say that what did Weber tell us that we need to take? And what is the new Weberian telling us? That merit system, merit principle, is an effective way to get the best and to be able to get good leaders, for example, and be able for these good leaders to lead very well. And you see, so one of my presentations, I talk about even responsible leadership, which is a new idea that is coming up. How do we have such leaders? for example, to show that I am in the service because I want to serve Ghana. Now, until we depoliticize and focus more on the marriage system and the marriage principle that people get job, not because they know me, not because they are party foot soldiers, not because uh, it's the ministers or somebody's girlfriend, we will have this problem because you end up putting what we call, what we call square pegs in round holes. And in most cases, this is what has happened. And when the person doesn't have the leadership qualities, or if he's there to just serve a political master, for example, all that he or she will do is to please that political master rather than please even uh, uh, his or her own co uh, own workers. I'll give you a good example. And sorry, Mr. Mayor, if I use it as an example. Now, as the mayor is sitting here, I think uh, uh, the dean made mention of the fact that the mayor has been there for four years, so probably he's been doing a very good job. I'm sure any time the mayor goes to bed, he's thinking that, am I going to be fired tomorrow? Because, you see, the mayor is just in the hands of the president. The president probably can go and sleep, and somebody, a party chairman, can go to the president and say, look, the mayor has not given me a contract, therefore fire him. And you know that is the party people who actually gives the names out for the president to select. Now, if we have a system where the mayor and the president is de-associated, for example, where the mayor is elected for four years, the mayor knows that in four years, if I haven't done something better, then I can be voted out. I don't depend on the president, whether I have an appointment or not. Hence, the mayor is focused on, because he, know, he needs to be re-elected, because he's interested in re-election, he will do what is best for the citizens, so that the citizens will re-vote or re-elect him so that he can be in power. So until we build that kind of uh, system in which we, I mean, politics aside, we find a way to build enough bureaucratization where merit becomes the principle, um, I'm afraid that this poor leadership thing will continue because people will get positions not because they merit that position, for example, but it's because it depends on the whims and caprices of somebody else. And so I'm not surprised that you talked about, and that applies to the health sector services, for example. Uh, we were here in which uh, some doctors about three years ago were just being transferred here and there, for example. Why by a minister? Because maybe the minister doesn't like him or her. We don't know yet why the issue is. And I'll give you a good example uh, in the politicization. Uh, I had a discussion with one of the uh, 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 head of the civil service. And he talked about an example where a minister comes in, and the first thing the minister says is that, I don't like this chief director, transfer him. But 
that head was able to insist that, no, I think this is the pe best person that I have for you, so I'm not going to do that. So when he insisted, the minister backed out. Six months later, the head of the civil service decided to transfer the chief director. As soon as the letter got to the minister, the minister ran to the head of the uh, office of the head of civil service and said, no way, I'm not going to let you transfer this, this person, because the person has done a yeoman's job. He was qualified for the position. He knew why he was there, and he was able to come out with the policies that pleased the minister. But from politicization, the minister would have let him go. And what would have happened? He would have had the problem. So until these kind of systems are put in place, until we revisit those ideas of merit and depoliticize the public service, we will continue to have this capacity problem. Um, the question of trust, I think, <laughs> thank the dean for highlighting that it's a very tough question. Um, trust is extremely important. But how do you even build a trust? You see, if I know that I got my position, um, at, let's say I got my position through merit. If I go to uh, Dean Bawole right now, and I know that I got my position through merit, Dean Bawole will trust me, and I will trust him because I know that he will not say that, Frank, you are fired. He's not Donald Trump to fire me, for example. You see, so if we start building that effective state, it's obvious that it will lead to that burden of trust because you know that the person that you are working with also got his or her position based on qualification and therefore you have the same idea or the same uh, uh, perspective on how to get things done. And doing that, you are able to build trust. In fact, you're right, trust is the most important element in every society and it's not different from the administrative state. Hence, it's extremely important that as we build this, uh, de depoliticize the uh, public service, for example, it can lead to, to trust. One of the mistrust in Ghana is the, the, again, politicization. And the politicization is not only from the politics or the political authorities, but even within public, uh, some of the organizations, the ministries and other departments. You go and interview public servants, and sometimes they said, well, as soon as a minister comes in, somebody will go there and say, oh, uh, Frank is an MPP man, Dr. Uh, Dimbaole is an NDC man. So they start pointing out because the minister doesn't know. And so you can only build trust when everybody knows that I got my job because I got it through marriage. But if I got my job through a uh, uh, political connection, for example, then it's obvious that in order to keep my post or somebody who was supposed to get that position didn't get it, he's going to tell the minister and I'm going to be fired. And so it's extremely important that we use to build, we have to build that capacity through that depoliticization process and revisit the merit system. Um, let me get to your second question. Uh, uh, I think, what is your view on the minds of, of Ghana is that the best answer is to have statement bureaucracy? Um, unfortunately, I don't think I have met the idea of statement uh, bureau, uh, bureaucrats. Uh, but every bureaucrat is supposed to have certain virtues, norms, uh, ethics, and that's what we call, I, I describe as a uh, responsible manager. Let me read something quickly. He said, a responsible manager is a manager who is no longer irresponsible, open to his surroundings, a sense of citizenship, close to his co-workers, but able to handle economic measures. You see, so you see, when we have responsible managers, they can be the statesmen, bureaucrats that we're talking about, because they know why they are there, and they've gotten their position again because of merit. And so they will be responsible in terms of doing things. I think when we have such bureaucrats, for example, then obviously they will become a statement because they want to do what is right. And most bureaucrats want to do what is right. So I believe that yeah, that is the idea that we Do we have responsible managers? Can we call them statesmen? Perhaps yes. Maybe once their job is done. And we can uh, applaud them once they leave because of the legacy that they might have left behind. Uh, Teresa asked a second question. Uh, Dean, can I go on, please? Yes, um, but, but because of our time, we, we are going to, uh, I'm going to pick and choose a few more questions. Okay. Uh, Teresa has had a choice um, uh, already. So let's see. Um, Surugu, uh, Dr. Justice Surugu, do you still want to ask your question? And then I have Barbara, whose hand is up, and then I'll go back to, and then that will be our last set of questions because okay. we need to close at 8 o'clock. Uh, thank, you. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you, Prof. Baole, and thank you, Professor Hime. Professor Hime, nice to see you again. Hey, uh, well, I can see your picture. <laughs> yes. Um, it's, I have a simple question. You spoke about the fact that we need to have a merit system, we need to develop a bureaucratic system and all that. I, I had this 
10 years ago when I was a student. And probably I'm going to hear it within the next 10 years again whilst I'm alive. So why? What is the problem? Because everybody is talking about the problems that we have. You go and meet the ministers. Before they became ministers, they will be talking about the same problem. When they become ministers, their behavior is different. So what is that one proposal that you want to put forward that when we do this, we will be able to get there? I'm asking, will the current system allow the such reforms to be undertaken? Okay. Th thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, okay, good. So, Justice, uh, Musa, uh, doctor in uh, Germany. Uh, uh, Germany. Uh, I have Barbara. Barbara, would you unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question and please be brief. Okay. Hi, Doc. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, yes, my, my question is, I think it's quite similar to what uh, Dr. Musa asked because um, I think we are all very much aware of what is supposed to be done, okay? Because with the civil service, if we are to play it in a way of a private sector, the way the private sector manage their business, if we should apply that in the, in the public sector, we, we are going to have a smooth and a very transparent um, um, system. But why is it that it's, it, we, can't, we are not able to implement it? What, what is the problem? You know, it's like we have the professors, we have the big men who have done so much, um, are learned in the public admin and all that, but uh, we are not able to implement it. And it has become more of an African thing. When you talk about it, oh, we are in Africa, it's, it's, uh, it's okay. What, what do we have to do? That okay. is my question. Thank you very much, Barbara. And I have Eric. Eric, please briefly your question. Eric Nyaku. Yes, please. Yes, good Hello, Doc. Prof, good yes. evening for the brilliant submission. Thank you, sir. Yeah. But my, my question is in the context of the management of, of the pandemic, vis a vis the point that you have enumerated. Uh, we, what I have observed um, in all the advanced countries and in countries where the public administration is running effectively and efficiently is that they have all struggled and that this pandemic has tested leadership at every level mm -hmm. to the extent that countries like India, which has a brilliant and efficient local government system, has struggled to keep hold of the pandemic. My question has to do with the citizenry, the responsibility of the citizenry in helping to adhere to the safety protocols vis-a-vis -vis leadership at all the levels, be it local, regional. So that has been, but outside of the context of this management of the COVID-19, I think all the points raised, I, I agree, the merit system and all that, I agree. But in the management of this pandemic, I have, what I have seen is that we have all struggled, whether the advanced countries or whether countries found in Africa, we have all struggled to stem it. So what do we do? What would you suggest that going forward? Thank you. Because Thank you. Uh, is, uh, Eric, I think your question is ask and it's okay. succinct. So let's get uh, okay. Prof. Ohimin to respond. Okay. I Let me add okay. just one more from the... Right. Thank uh, you. A lot of the, the, the things we have on the chat room are comments, and so I will not bother you uh, with them. But, uh, for example, Prof. Apodazi, uh, perfectly agrees with you and the need to have a system that uh, selects the best candidates for the best position as you described in terms of the Asian model. Um, Jack Jima talks about the Barbarian model and, and the ability to build capacity through that. Uh, what then should be the immediate crucial step? Very simple question straight as if uh, similar to what Dr. Justice Musa asked. So uh, it looks like the questions are getting around, what, what can we do? <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. I think, thank you, Dean. I think you've summarized the questions for me. So let me answer the question, what can we do? Or what should we do? Um, I may be a little bit theoretical, so pardon me uh, if I, I am a little bit theoretical. What I've realized in my studies over the years in Ghana is that, as I said, uh, when we had in Chroma's time, that was where we had a break. 
in which the British system from 1960, in which the British system was more, more or less effectively uh, damaged. Ever since, what I've observed is that we, we have been reforming. It's not that we have not been trying to do something. And that's why I said, pardon me, Mr. Uh, Professor Baule, you know, it's not that we have not been doing something, but the most, imp what we have been doing, which to me is wrong, is that we have been doing what the literature calls path dependency. In other words, when you look at all the reforms that have taken place up to today, and that is why I found it a very disheartening when I saw the reform that um, the Akufuado government wanted to do, that I felt sorry for that, that I knew that it was not going to end anywhere. Because you see, over the years, we have followed the same kind of path. If you look at when the first reforms that were begun in 1966, it seems every government will come and repeat what we haven't done, but follow the same path. And to me, the first thing we need to do is to what we call break the path and go back to what we call uh, path departure. We need to depart. For example, we know that the bureaucracy is politicized. Everybody accept that fact. How then do we uh, stop the politicization? We need to take the bull by the horn and say, look, maybe I'm the president or maybe I'm the governor or maybe I'm advising the president. I say, look, despite your foot soldiers, despite whatever, no, we need to break this path. Because if we break this path and we have efficiency and effectiveness in the system, it's going to help my government in terms of what it will deliver. So until we break that path, for example, until we take the, the what you call the bull by the horn and break that path dependency approach, we will not, we will continue repeating the same mistakes. In, in one of the things that I've, in my studies that we've come back, in 1983, when Rawlings had this uh, revolution and the structural adjustment, for example, that was a critical juncture moment in which some of these things should have been stopped. Yet, we continue the same path. In 1994, my discussion with some senior public servants, when they dis, di, did uh, the CISPIP, for example, you could see that the idea was to create a new path, but it ended up following the same path. So it is important to, for us as a nation to sit down and say, look, are we prepared to go through this path or are we to prepare to break the path and restart? Hence, path dependency has not necessarily helped us. Uh, if uh, 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 Professor uh, Musa, uh, it's important for us to now sit down and say, look, we need to develop. This is what the South Koreans did. They realized that the path they were following wasn't happening. So they broke their path, restarted a new path, in which then they said that we are going to follow the merit system. And that has helped them to develop the developmental state, and that has helped them to de develop very well. I think Barbara's question was uh, the private sector. Um, my dear sister, I think I would disagree with you a little bit. You see, most of the time, and this is the problem that uh, the neoliberal idea has brought to us, we think that we can just mimic uh, the private sector, but the private sector is totally uh, com uh, different when it comes to the public sector. Let's see, for example, most private sectors, the, most, the fundamental issue of accountability and those things is just uh, the profit. What am I bringing in? What's my profit margin? The, pri the public sector is not supposed to make profit. You see, I'm a poor guy from Bumpurugu. I still have to benefit from the state. In the private sector, he doesn't care. All that he cares about is my pocket. And so they tailor their management in the sense that how can I bring in money? In the administrative state, you can't do that. You have to tailor your management strategies to the point that can we help serve in terms of service delivery to the poor, whether the person has money or not to pay. Hence, you will see that a lot of the private sector, let me, there's a lot of studies, a lot of the private sector people who will do, I'm telling you, if you bring Bill Gates or um, Jeff Bozo, for example, to the public sector, they will fail completely because they're studies because they are completely different environment. And the way they see things is not as what a responsible public servant or manager will see. And that is why we say that we need to develop that capacity in our, so that managers can think in terms of how they can be able to develop. It doesn't mean that we cannot learn something from the private sector. However, when we learn, we need to adjust to meet the environment of the administrative sector. You cannot simply take it. I mean, and recently we've seen a lot of these private sector with the, all these men are collapsing and they are filing for bankruptcy, for example. Where is that? Why is that? So we need to look at it from ourselves and see how we want to develop our capacity and develop responsible managers. 
Um, I think the second, well, let me uh, talk about the management of the pandemic. I think that's what he's talking about. Um, you're right that a number of countries have, uh, almost every country has been affected because it wasn't, a lot of things were not expected. But again, if you can see, you can go through the system, you will see that the countries that have effective administrative state have been able to manage the system very well. And that's why I talked about the fact that they've been able to what you call flatten the curve. Um, in Ontario that I am in, for example, uh, in 104 days, we have not had a single death, for example. Uh, in New Zealand, it took them three, more than three months, 105 days, before they recorded the first, uh, another death. So you see every society that has been affected, but they have been able to perform creditably because the administrative state is very strong. So some of these states, for example, had researchers who knew the effectiveness of uh, um, uh, marks, for example. So they were able to recommend that. They were able to recommend that you have to go six feet. Um, they were able to recommend, even, even here, um, when the, we closed down the, uh, uh, the province of Ontario, for example, I asked a citizen, my wife, my kids never went up. For almost two months, I had to go and do groceries. And you go to groceries and you queue. So they know that, for example, in a big building, they will say only 50 people can get it. They have a system where they are counting how many people are in, how many people are coming out. So as two or three comes out, then two in the queue will go. So we're all standing outside, six feet apart, and then we have masks on. So those states that have, look at the Scandinavian countries, that have effective neo barbarian states, effective administrative states, have been able to manage this virus very well, compared to the US, where, for example, the administrative state is not there. That's why we see in Florida. That is why we see in uh, uh, Georgia, for example. That's why we see in Texas that people are dying. So when you compare the two, yes, the, uh, uh, every country has struggled a little bit, but a number of countries have been able to contain it. Uh, in Canada, I don't think you will get more than 10,000 deaths. And most of those deaths even happen in, old, in homes, retirement homes, where people are already sick and, and, and are there. But even that they open the economy here, a young people, number of young people are coming. Yeah. And the government is coming out with policies about social distances and those rest. So my point is that if we have an effective administrative state, you will be able to make up these policies that helps or that will help in terms of addressing some of the challenges that we've talked about. But obviously it's been affected by everybody. However, those that have strong and important administrative state have been able to minimize the impact of this COVID and they are working to solve that problem. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ahimi. I, I think that um, this, is, this is a very, very interesting conversation. And I guess that we can keep on and on and on. But I'm excited that this conversation has started because I, I, for, the, 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 for those who believe in Li Kuan Yu, those who believe in the Asian Tigers, the, the key thing that has driven their development has been the realization that we need a certain critical mass of people who have the skill sets and that irrespective of what the political divide is, we still need this. And there is an argument about the extent to which um, if, if I were the president uh, Akufuadu today, and if I decided to employ, uh, and excuse my analogy, if I decided to employ NDC, um, known NDC people, but who are very competent, rather than employ MPP people who are incompetent, what I seek to do is to be able to use the NDC people who are competent to drive my development agenda such that I can reach as many Ghanaians as possible so I would be celebrated as having accomplished my goal. However, if that can uh, succeed, then it means that this NDC competent people must accept that they want to be able to deliver for, for me and will not say, well, you are an MPP government and therefore as an NDC competent person, I do not intend to help you to achieve your goal. So this is a very big conversation that we have started. Unfortunately, we cannot finish the discussion today. And I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, it's been very, very exciting. Next week, we have another session. Please make time to join us. And forgive me for closing the session now because we targeted to make it within two hours. 
and it's just about two hours of two very, very interesting conversations and discussions. So next week, join us and we promise to make it exactly two hours. Next week, we have other uh, speakers who will be speaking to us. Uh, let me say thank you to all of you PhD students who joined. Uh, Dr. Uh, Musa Isa Justice joining us from Germany, our head of department. Uh, Dr. Kwame Asamoah, Reverend Darlington, thanks for joining. Uh, my uh, colleague head of department, um, Dr. Antonia Fodazi, for joining. Dr. Alex Akpabli, Dr. Uh, Albert Ahinkai, uh, Dr. Francis Agbeka. Uh, Deborah Elom. We have all of the people, Frank Obin, Amankwa, all of you, all of you um, who have joined from various parts of the world. Uh, Mr. Nuatunfu is Chief Director of Ministry of uh, Sanitation. My colleague, Dr. Samuel Simpson, Head of Department of Accounting, uh, and all of our students, um, clinical leadership uh, students, want to say thank you very much and to our very renowned, two renowned speakers, uh, Mayor um, Soa Ajay and um, Professor Frank Ohimi, uh, we want to thank you very much. This is me ex really exciting. So, so Professor Ohimi, this is a suspended conversation. We will get back to it one at a time. <laughs> and if I allow you, you see that all of your people, people want to know how do we do it, how do we do it? And I want to throw the question back to you. If you were the president, you the one participating in this session today, if you were the president, what would you do? If you were the president, would you refuse to appoint your brothers and sisters and, and cousins and party people? Would you? If you would not, then you should not put the question to the, to the professor. If you were the president and you would not give you know, way to only the people who you know who are there and near to you, then stop asking the question because we aren't going to go anywhere if nobody restrains themselves. And, and because we belong to this same society, it is a case that we all think that someone must restrain themselves and not us. But if we can do it, then you must be willing to do restrain yourself, refuse to employ your uncle, your, niece, your nieces and nephews in, into the workplace and get the people who are qualified. After all, when we talk about competent bureaucracy, we are not looking at the, the, the head office level. We are not looking at the top. We are looking at the lower level. So, uh, uh, Mr. George Lai, you, you work somewhere. How many people are you employing who do not belong to you but who are competent? Um, uh, Reverend, how many people are you employing who are competent but you do not know? Uh, my HOD, how many people are you employing who, who you do not know who are competent? And Dean Baune, how many people are you employing who you do not know, but you are just employing them because they are competent. And how many of us are willing to subject ourselves to a test or an exam and would agree that if we were ranked from 100 to, two, to, to zero and we are looking for only 50 people and we are not within the 50, but we know the president, we will refuse to go to the president and force him to, 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 to employ us. Maybe just before we go, when I finished training college, I was posted to a village called Jataku. My brother was a security supervisor. So I go to him and I tell my brother, I don't want to go to the village. I want to be in Yeji town. Then he looked at me and said, so whose brother should we take to the village? You go and bring somebody's brother. Let's take the person to the village and I will bring you to the town because you are my brother. And he says, when you were going to school and you were getting allowances, did you ask that you wanted to be in town? Now they have used somebody's taxpayers' money to pay you. Go and teach that children, you are telling me you don't want to go to the village and because you don't want to go, and because you are my brother, you don't want to go to the village. Bring me somebody's brother, let me take that person to the village and bring you who is my brother. I haven't forgiven him till now, but I went to the village because he refused to change it for me. Can we restrain ourselves? Because I think that that is where the bottom line is. But thank you very much for joining the conversation. Professor Himi, I salute you for the excellent presentation. Uh, Mayor Sowa, I salute you for the excellent presentation. And I wish all of us a very pleasant evening. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Baule. And we'll talk about we'll Thank talk about we we'll know we'll talk. So yes, please, yes, please, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Asawa, I will talk to you uh, behind bars.
Yes, 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 yes. Well, as I'm asking you, uh, what about mer mer meritocracy? And uh, yeah, I tell, as I said, I'll talk to you behind bars. <laughs> yeah, professional representation. I know. I don't I don't know yeah, exactly. <laughs> Prof <laughs> Professor, so we can have uh, we can we can have that conversation. <laughs> yes, sir. We'll, when, when, uh, uh, when this COVID is over, we will fly you here, so we will have it over a bottle of uh, uh, Sobolu. Or a bottle okay, of Sobolu. Okay, Sobolu. <laughs> <laughs> Thank well, you, you ladies and gentlemen. Have a very good evening. The only, the only meet I would like is that confirm. So if you can oh, get a confirm, I will confirm you are guaranteed. That one I can sponsor it myself. Don't worry at all. <laughs> <laughs> and my agent is here. He's a rich man. My agent is a rich teasers. man. You know they yes. said teasers. You know they said that that one, the teasers is very good. Hey, so, it's it's anti COVID medicine. Many many. Exactly. <laughs> The way my wife is troubling me with now now these days, I say you don't want me to die. I say yeah yeah. It's okay okay yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, colleagues. Right. Thanks well, thank so much. You guys. Hope and to have see a very good you. evening. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Yes. Thank we'll you. talk behind bars. So you, yes, Dr. please. Dr. I'll send you a message. Then we can talk. Yes, please. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, somebody's requesting for the, the, I think, the slice or something. It's a small slide, and I'm not yeah, a part yeah. of PowerPoint, but I can send it to Dr. Bowie. The video is available also on my uh, my Facebook already, So I, because it was also live on Facebook. So my it's it's live on my so those of you who are on my Facebook you can get a video there, but this will be edited and put on our YouTube channel, uh, and I thank you all for the, the the time. Next week around the same time you join us, uh, do miss it. Thank you. And now with your permission, I will call the meeting off. Thank you. Thank you very much.